let's introduce our first speakers. So some of you may know Michael Bott and Rupert Soskin. They are today known as the prehistory guys. They produced the brilliant Standing with Stones documentary um, way back in 2008. And actually, I think Michael came to the conference that year and presented it and kind of shared it, shared some of the film with us. They've been working on a brilliant podcast, the Prehistory Guys podcast. They've been interviewing lots of very interesting archaeologists, anthropologists and researchers. They've been getting out on the land, sharing their research. Uh, and if you've uh, been watching British TV for years, you may have seen Michael Bott uh, on a few TV programs as well, um, uh, such as Doctors, I believe, amongst others. So he's got he's quite well known in that part of the world. Um, and Rupert is, um, he says, education in design, photography and natural history and has published on that and studied that. Um, and so, yeah, it gives me great pleasure to welcome these guys. So welcome to Michael Bott and Rupert Soskin. <laughs> Woohoo! General cheering. We can't hear you. So we're just going to imagine that you're all deliriously happy to see us. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, Hugh. And hello, everybody. Good morning. It's great to be here. Great to have been invited. And obviously, it was sad that we can't all be together in the flesh and going off for a drink afterwards. But hey, we're going to have a good time anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're delighted to be kicking off proceedings. So, it being nice and early on a Saturday, we thought we'd ease you into the weekend with some <laughs> hardcore Bayesian analysis and pie charts. No, all right. No, we didn't. No, we no, didn't. No, no. Now, <laughs> some of you will know that a part of what we do as the prehistory guys is gather up archaeological news and information from all over the world. So we thought a fun way to start Megalithomania 2021 would be to share some of our favourite items from the last year or so. Some are very recent discoveries, some might not be new at all, but we feel maybe should, they should be more widely known. Either way, over to you Michael to start the Towie Ball rolling. Now, we don't know, but our guess is that this first thing that blew our minds early on when we first started the podcast back in 2018 will be mentioned again by the end of the day. In other words, it's more than likely that Mike Parker Pearson will be mentioning Aubrey Hole number seven in his talk later on. Now, we don't mean to steal any of his thunder, fat chance of that happening anyway, seeing as he actually co-led the project that we're talking about here. However, in 2018, after a bit of a break since the production and promotion of Standing With Stones and the excitement around that had petered out, we were in catch-up mode and so there were many surprises waiting for us in advances in prehistoric archaeology that had occurred in the interim. The major excavation of Stonehenge in the 20th century was that undertaken by William Hawley and his assistant R.S. Newell in the early 1920s. To cut a long story short, they retrieved masses of cremated remains from the Aubrey holes and the ditch within the excavated area. It turns out that these remains languished for years in Newell's attic because no museum would take them into their archives back then, the reason being that they thought there was nothing to be learned from the bones. And eventually, in January 1935, the contents of four sackfuls of cremated bone from Hawley's excavations were poured into Aubrey Hole 7 in a kind of rudimentary prehistoric time capsule exercise, I suppose in the hope that future archaeologists may be able to make something of them. Well, that in itself is extraordinary enough, but that wasn't what blew our minds. In 2008, future archaeologists Mike Parker Pearson, Mike Pitts and Julian Richards re-excavated Aubrey Hole 7 as part of the larger Stonehenge Riverside project and retrieved the remains there. Beneath a lead plaque was a 30 centimetre layer of jumbled cremated bone across the base of the hole. No context, no differentiation, a mixture of recognisable larger pieces together with tiny slivers and crumbs. Nevertheless, 
Despite the disappointment that Hawley and Newell had left no clues as to what was what or what was from where, the future archaeologist research team have worked wonders applying modern techniques to those remains, just as might have been hoped 80 years earlier. The headline discoveries made from Aubrey Hole 7 have been a from carbon-14 analysis that Stonehenge was used as a cremation cemetery for mostly adult men and women for five centuries after 3000 BC. But that wasn't what blew our minds. B. From CT scan analysis of 22 inner ear bones retrieved, it was determined that of those individuals, 9 were male and 14 female, 3 not being able to be determined. Can we read from this that women were being more honoured among the elite around 3000 BC than we might have thought? It's hard to say. But that wasn't what blew our minds either. C. From osteological examination, it was found that relatively very few children were buried at Stonehenge compared to remains from long barrows. That again, is very tantalising, but still not exactly mind-blowing. D. Strontium isotope analysis has revealed that a significant proportion of 25 individuals represented that could be examined in this way most likely were not local to the Salisbury Plain. In fact, 10 of the 25 showed isotopic ratios inconsistent with the area around Stonehenge, meaning that they could not have solely sourced their food from around Stonehenge and probably either got all of their food further afield or lived somewhere else entirely. It seems that during the last decade of their lives, they had moved to and from either South West England or West Wales. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that from Mike Parker Pearson later on. But even with all the implications and correlations to do with blue stones coming from Wales and the Bruxelles via wine mourn stone circle, what was even more mind-blowing to us was the fact that none of this analysis could have been completed. Not one part of each of these revelations would have been available to us had not one person, that's one person, undertaken to painstakingly pick through over half a million pieces, lumps, slivers, mere crumbs of charred bone, identifying each minute piece so that the information essentially lost by Hawley about which bone belonged to which individual could be reconstituted and turned into cohesive archaeological data. And if you've ever wondered how long it might take to work your way through half a million pieces of cremated bone, this particular individual has set the benchmark at seven years. So, yes, our minds blown. Our hats go off to you, Dr. Christy Willis, and all hardworking archaeologists that do such painstaking work behind the scenes. Dedication and diligence beyond the call of duty that illuminates our past in new ways on an almost daily basis. And I'm afraid this is why Rupert and I shall forever remain fantasy archaeologists and never actually bear the title archaeologists. Real archaeologists, we salute you. Yes, real archaeologists, we do salute you, but Christy Willis... <laughs> Christy wow. Willis, we are wow. in awe. We are in awe. <laughs> anyway. That's a well-earned doctorate, that was. <laughs> it certainly was. It certainly <laughs> was. Um, anyway, I am taking us, uh, I'm taking us back 5,000 years to a place called Kozice in southern Poland for something rather dramatic, but not to mention desperately sad. Now, First off, has to be said, this research has involved a lot of people, mostly from various departments in the University of Copenhagen, but it really is an international project. Anyway, the discovery was made back in 2011 of a mass grave associated with the globular amphora culture. Personally, I'd never <laughs> heard of them. I don't believe that title. I've never believe. heard of them. But there you are, the globular amphora, amphora culture. Uh, now, the, the grave included 15 men, women and children, the youngest being a toddler about two and a half years old, all of them murdered by having their heads staved in by something rather large and heavy. Now, 
Apart from the excavation itself, the original researchers had carried out a massive amount of analysis, separating out males and females, etc. But it was only recently that the burial was reassessed using the latest DNA techniques, which kind of changed everything. So there were eight males and seven females. But I'm actually going to read you a couple of paragraphs from the, uh, the published research paper because it sums it up quite dramatically what they could extract from the DNA. They said, overall, we identified four nuclear families in the grave, which are for the most part represented by mothers and their children. Closely related kin were buried next to each other. A mother was buried cradling her child, and siblings were placed side by side. Evidently, these individuals were buried by people who knew them well and who carefully placed them in the grave according to familial relationships. For example, individual 14, hopefully you can see uh, on the, uh, uh, the graphic here that they've, they've numbered each of the bodies. For example, individual 14, the oldest individual in the grave, was buried close to her two sons, individuals 5 and 15. Whereas individual 8, a 30 to 35 year old woman, was buried with her teenage daughter, individual 9, and 5 year old son, individual 13. Using genome-wide patterns of IBS, we were also able to reconstruct more complex relationships. Individuals 5, 10, 11 and 15 all appear to have been brothers and yet they do not have the same mother. Individual 14 is the mother of individuals 5 and 15, but not 10 and 11, suggesting that they might be half-brothers. However, all four of them share the same mitochondrial DNA haplotype, suggesting that their mothers might also have been related. Interestingly, the older males' fathers are mostly missing from the grave. This is so significant suggesting that it might have been them who buried their kin. The only father present in the grave is individual 10, whose partner and son are placed together opposite him in the grave. In addition, there is a young boy, uh, individual 7, aged 2 to 2.5 years old, whose parents are not in the grave, but he is placed next to other individuals to whom he is closely related through various second-degree relationships. Finally, there is individual 3, an adult female who does not seem to be genetically related to anyone in the group. However, her position in the grave close to individual 4, a young man, suggests that she may have been as close to him in life as she was in death. That's the end of the quote. But the fact that none of the family's fathers were amongst the dead. Now, this is where we can really be a bit unscientific and just fill in our own blanks, because how do you how do you make sense of that? You know, the implication there could be that the fathers were away, maybe fighting a battle somewhere, and they returned home to find their entire families murdered. So that's why it's the families that would be in the grave, maybe, and, and you know, none of the, uh, the adult males. It's, it's an extraordinary thing. The thing is, and the point of this, and the mind-blown thing, the point is that just a few years ago, this could only have been recorded as a mass grave. The mm. fact that we can now extract such intricate levels of detail turns anonymous prehistory into something far more tangible and personal. Mm. And on that note, back to you. Well, it's a bit grim for a Saturday morning. <laughs> it is. It is. I apologise. It's grim, but it's mind-blowingly grim. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm up next uh, with me, the next bit, and I've just realised that, that, uh, that isn't that isn't exactly all happy clappy either. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Right, my turn again. A lot of people have been living in some tough bonkers times recently with challenges that may tempt one or two to wish perhaps they'd been born in another time in history, or maybe even prehistory come to that. 
Now, it's, it's tempting to imagine a time gone by as some kind of blissful Arcadia where life is an idyll and it's uh, just us, nature and a caring cosmos. And I think it's a, a good idea to hold on to that thought from time to time. However, if you are ever given the chance of a one-way time machine trip to a time of your choice, my advice would be not to go back to circa 3300 BC to the Cotswold Escarpment in Gloucestershire and the site of Crickley Hill. For this, alongside Hamilton Hill in Dorset, is the site of one of the earliest known battles in Britain. And you probably already knew that. And you probably envisioned a hill in the English countryside where some arrowheads have been found. Well, you think, do I really want to visit a hill? Yes, actually, you do. I did back end of 2019, and, yep, my head was blown. The thing is, Crickley Hill isn't just about a battle. It turns out to be a story lasting 3,000 years, right from the early Neolithic through to the Iron Age. And there wasn't just the one battle, there was another one, it seems, in the Iron Age. Two battles then. So what's going on at this place? What's so special that this little patch of land overlooking the Seven Vale, what makes it so valuable? The thing is, it's when you visit the place that one major reason becomes clear. I don't think I've stood anywhere else with a connection to prehistory that has such a clear sense of marking the edge of territory. You stand on the edge of this escarpment, on this promontory, overlooking the land, being able to see all the way over to Wales. The overwhelming sense is that behind you, this area we now call the Cotswolds, is a territory utterly separate from the land before you in the Seven Vale. Like any castle, on any boundary, defining the line between one interest and another, whoever commanded this spot held the territory. For whatever reason, for two long phases in prehistory, this place was chosen as a stronghold, first in the Neolithic from about 3500 to 2500 BC, and then in the Iron Age from about 750 BC until the Romans were here. It makes you wonder if the Bronze Age might have been relatively free of conflict and the need to protect this particular boundary. Anyway, we know the stuff we know about Crickley Hill because it has been the subject of what must be one of the longest and most thorough archaeological excavations ever. More than 5,000 volunteers from around the world worked on this site between 1969 and 1994. That's 25 successive seasons of digging directed throughout by one man, Dr Philip Dixon. Needless to say, therefore, that there's an amazing amount of detail to the story of this place, and I'm afraid far too much to delve into here. But one thing of interest really worth mentioning is that the scatter of arrowheads from the earlier Neolithic battle tell us that whoever the attackers were, they had already ascended the escarpment and were approaching the settlement, that is the causeway enclosure, out on the promontory on the level from the north. From 400 arrowheads found, it seems that firepower was concentrated on the entranceways to the enclosure, arrows shot through and, and falling beyond inside the enclosure. Now make of that what you will, but what's fascinating is that the arrowhead scatter proves that the enclosure had palisades along the top of the earthen banks. How? because there was a line of arrowheads along the top of the bank where they had either hit the palisade and fallen straight down or had fallen with the palisade in place. Amazing. The thing is, you can go to Crickley Hill and let your imagination run wild. For anyone interested in the slightest in British prehistory, a visit will reveal so much more than you may have bargained for. There are many battle sites throughout the land belonging to more recent times and particularly to the Wars of the Roses and the Civil War, for instance. Visit any one of these well-known sites, however, on any day other than when the reenactors are out and about and there's not much to see. That's not the case at Crickley Hill. It's in a park managed by the National Trust. There's a visitor centre, but more importantly, there's enough left on the ground here to walk you through those 3,000 years of prehistory. There's the Iron Age earthen ramparts, hugely impressive. 
There's a reconstruction of part of the Wooden Hill Fort defences, complete with overhead walkway. Move past that and you're into the Iron Age settlement with post holes marked out on the ground showing you where the huts and buildings were. And then beyond that, the remains of a bank and ditch marking the boundaries of the original Neolithic causeway enclosure and, of course, the site of one of the oldest known battles in Britain. Prepare to have your mind blown, I say. Well, I, I think that's enough death and destruction for the moment. Well, I'm saying that. I'm going back to a grave. What do you want? Um, it's archaeology. Uh, old stuff. <laughs> Um, well, this is a fascinating discovery from Siberia, actually, from the Novosib uh, Novosibirsk Institute of Archaeology. And they have found two remarkable Bronze Age burials at the Ust Tartas archaeological site, thought to belong to the Odinov culture. Uh, now, the two men in this burial seem to have been shaman of some description. One was wearing a costume which incorporated a collar made of around 50 birds' beaks. Uh, and we're not, not small either, you know, they, these are no, we're talking about herons or cranes. You know, there must have been quite an impressive uh, uh, piece of uh, clothing. Anyway, uh, the second male was buried with what appeared to be a pair of bronze spectacles. Uh, the team have been excavating at the Ustata site for quite a while, and they've already found over 30 other burials. But Lilia Koboleva from the Institute said that nothing found so far is anything like as impressive as these two individuals. So the Birdman's collar... We call him the Birdman, you know, but the Birdman's <laughs> collar is, is, you know, you, you can visualise uh, what that was like. But these glasses are really intriguing. It, it might be more accurate to call them eyewear for the moment. You know, judging from the position of them in relation to the skeleton, it's pretty conclusive that they fell off his face as his body decomposed. Uh, the eyepieces themselves look more like hemispherical cups with holes in the centre. Uh, they must have looked quite daunting when they were bright, shiny metal. <laughs> but uh, and obviously it's highly unlikely that we'll ever know how they were used or perceived. But um, uh, another interesting feature of the Spectacle Man's burial is that the grave had more than one level and he was buried beneath two young children. Uh, separated from them by a wooden divider. Now, at this stage, it's impossible to say how much time separated the burials, but, you know, maybe they were his children, maybe not. Now, I have to say, of course, everyone leaps to the shamanistic side of things, but I like to think that actually they might have been a Bronze Age Flanagan and Allen. <laughs> well, they were definitely odd enough... <laughs> Boom, very, boom! Very good. From the odd enough culture. <laughs> very good. And on that note, I think we should move swiftly <laughs> along. <fun. laughs> you know what? Uh, maybe uh, I should get a Birdman mask and you, you get some uh, <laughs> some glasses. We should yes. do all our shows dressed as the... <laughs> it's a very good idea. Uh, the I Siberian... <laughs> <laughs> Birdman and his strange friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sure we could convert those into some very cool shades, actually. Ah, uh, yes, why not? I <laughs> think not. Anyway, uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm sure uh, we all know uh, of the Thornborough Henges, a tantalising arrangement of three massive henges in the Yorkshire countryside that seem to honour the arrangement of the three stars of Orion's belt in the heavens. Of the three, two are easily accessible on open ground and well worth the visit. The third, the northern henge, is hidden away in trees and seems rather secret and protected. But nevertheless, late 2019, I was a brave boy and stole into those woods. Now, rather than telling you about how my mind was blown, the next five minutes is actual footage of me having my mind blown. 
I'm standing on a quiet country road somewhere in North Yorkshire. London's about um, 220 miles that way, Edinburgh's about 180 miles that way. Over there, uh, the west coast of England, about 70 miles, and over that way, uh, Scarborough on the east coast is about 70 miles. Now, I've never been here before, um, but I happen to know that just over in there, in those woods, uh, is something quite extraordinary. And although the name is known, it is quite overlooked. So, uh, as I say, I've not been here before, um, and this is something of a recce for me. And uh, so I hope you enjoy this um, little voyage of discovery uh, as much as I do. And uh, you know, hopefully we're all seeing this uh, for the first time together. Okay, let's go. And, <laughs> believe it or not, we just stepped onto the bank of an enormous henge. How is it possible? <laughs> you're thinking for a monument like this to be hidden away from sight in a wood no signs no nothing this is one of the most significant if not largest henge monuments uh, in Britain not only that but there's two more of them just south within a mile this we're told is the least disturbed of the three henges and actually probably of all henges I mean, <laughs> it's uh, rather disguised by the fact it's covered in woods. Uh, of course, it would have been open. Um, but in terms of preservation, this is pretty good. I mean, the ditch down there is pretty, pretty, I should think it would have been at least uh, twice as deep as that. <laughs> it's absurd. It's just incredible to be here. Uh, and to be standing, you know, aside from Orkney and aside from uh, Wiltshire and uh, the Stonehenge landscape, this has got to be as significant, at least, as any of them. And yet here it is, hidden away in the quiet. I think I'm standing now at the, uh, the northern entrance, so let's cross over the northern entrance here wow across the ditch let's come into the middle this uh, henge is like the other two uh, is in the vicinity of about 550 feet across don't quote me on that we'll clear that up later um, but um, they're big so I'm just crossing back over. This place is massive. You know what? Even with all these trees, I'm getting the sense of a massive arena. My goodness. So impressive. So impressive. There's nothing like it. Never seen anything like it. You see, here's, here's the thing. I'm thrilled and excited. Even now, looking at it, you know, as a 21st century human being, and all, all I can see is, you know, the sense of it through these woods. And it's enthralling to me, the sense of space here. Imagine what it would have been like traveling to this place, mounting this bank and being presented with this extraordinary arena. It takes your breath away. It truly does.
Now, the thing was, with coming back three years ago to the realm of standing with stones, Neolithic and all things prehistoric, Rupert and I have been a little bit like little boys coming into a sweet shop for the first time. <laughs> see, <it's laughs> not, see, you're not for the first time. <laughs> uh, no, that's true. <laughs> we, we've actually been quite overwhelmed with all there is to take on board, uh, certainly once we rebranded ourselves as the prehistory guys. Now, Standing with Stones was, as many as you know, uh, concerned solely with megalithic building in Britain and Ireland. But latterly, of course, we've been casting the net much further afield. And it didn't take long to come across the existence of the extraordinary site of Pamelta in northeastern Germany. I'm sure many of you are aware of this extraordinary site and won't be surprised to hear that it's often referred to as the German Stonehenge. Pomelta, however, was constructed solely of wood, a huge palisaded circle, and if the modern interpretation and reconstruction are anything to go by, concentric circles of timber frames echoing the Stonehenge trilithons, all enclosed within large enclosing earthen circular banks and ditches. Radiocarbon dating puts the construction and use, whatever that was, of Pamelta a couple of hundred years after the phase of Stonehenge that we know and love so well went up, i.e. about 2300 BC. Now naturally, all sorts of questions start to be asked about the possible correlations and similarities between the two. Did one influence the other? Were their purposes similar? Are there clues in one that may help interpret the other? Maybe, but those are questions for another time, because it turns out that taking a glance at Pamelta was a case of just lifting the edge of the carpet. Yeah. Look, we, we've got our hinges. We're rightly very proud of our hinges. There are big ones, small ones, there are even super ones. Truth is, that there are quite a few of them out there. I mean, way beyond your Avebury's, your Mount Pleasant's, your Mornbury's, your Mordens, your Knowlton's, your Maybra's, your Brodger's. Um, your Devil's uh, Coitz's. Devil's Coitz, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, and a few more than escape my memory. Oh, mm -hmm. Balfog, there's a good one. Balfog is a good one. Name, name to conjure with. <laughs> Arbelow, did and you we, say Arbelow? Ah, below. Thank you very much indeed. Anyway, uh, Balfour, yeah, we must go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the point is, we've got quite a few, but have we got any Kreisgrabenanlagen? That word would suggest we're back in Germany again, and yes, we are. And it's a word that means circular ditched enclosure. Maybe a word that's not quite as picky as the definition of henge has become, but nevertheless we know which ballpark we're in. Apparently, there are up to 150 known Kreisgrabenanlagen in Central Europe. But here's the mind-bender. Pamelta, which we kicked off want, uh, with, isn't really one of them. However, there's another place called Gossack Circle, which almost looks the same. I mean, if you've can see the pictures on the screen now and to look at them at a glance. Um, those are both reconstructions, by the way. Uh, you may say, well, what's the difference? Uh, the answer is about two and a half thousand years, as it turns out. So here's the mind bending problem. We look at Pamelta, that, I mean, by that I mean Rupert and I, we looked at Pamelta and we, by default, sort of became aware of Gossack Circle, which in turn leads us to the word Kreisgrabenanlagen and to the fact that circular ditched enclosures are as common as anything all over Europe and something a Neolithic person would expect to see all over the place 6,000 years ago. Which leads to the question, are our henges, although much later than these European counterparts, that special? Do we need to look to the continent for an explanation for what was going on with them and how people related to them? So we've only scratched the surface here, but despite the vast stretch of time involved, surely it's a new context within which to regard our own hinges. If not mind blown, certainly horizons expanded.
you know, I think this next piece might be strangely related in a way. Uh, this is a strangely wonderful piece. Strangely related? Strangely related, yes. Well, you'll see what I mean in a minute. Uh, this is a wonderful piece of research from UCL, University College London, although the team actually responsible for this, they've now all moved into new areas of research at different universities. Uh, but uh, going back to their paper that came out a couple of years ago, evidence has emerged in the Balkans that people were using cattle for heavy work as much as 2,000 years earlier than previously thought. Now this pushes the practice back to around 6,000 BC, 8,000 years ago in mainland Europe and it's yet another pointer towards the widespread use of cattle in human history. Now. I have to admit that when I first saw the headline of the article, I imagined that they had found a yoke of some sort, but actually it's the foot bones of the cattle. Because when placed under habitual strain, the inner part of the foot associated with load bearing shows extra bone growth and broadening where muscle and ligaments attach. Now, the researchers took samples from 11 different Neolithic sites throughout the Balkans, looking specifically at the foot bones of both aurochs and domestic cattle. If you want it in a nutshell, and I quote, uh, we're talking about the broadening of the medial condyles for both metacarpals and metatarsals, as well as extension of the medial proximal articular facet of both first and second phalanges. Phalanges? Phalanges. Uh, so there you are, there you have it. Um, now, <laughs> um, it is very interesting that this research doesn't seem to be changing the thinking about the origins of ploughing, etc., which they still think was much later. So it really means that people were using cattle in a similar way to how we use shire horses, most likely for dragging huge timbers around for construction. So there's your connection with somewhere like Pomelta, for example, where, uh, you know, this this vision of people pulling stuff around. Well, no, use. Can you imagine if you were using aurochs and cattle? Much easier. Um, now, like so many things, th this came about just because it's somebody noticed something. You know, a, a similar foot bone uh, was found earlier in Syria, but the wear on that wasn't uh, wasn't conclusive. And then a number of them were excavated around Serbia and Croatia. Now, we tracked down one of the authors, Dr. Mark van der Linden, who is now at Bournemouth University, and uh, wanted to ask him if there were any new developments on this research. And basically, all the researchers are doing other things. And he said that as far as he knows, no one has taken up the idea to investigate all the cattle bones languishing in the back rooms of museums and universities. So I say that this should be a student task and all archaeology departments everywhere should get on a mission to see if we can spot this pattern of bone growth throughout the Neolithic and Megalithic world. Just think of all those different ways that people have imagined our ancestors moving stones around when all the time they might simply have been using teams of cattle. Mind blown. And mind blown. Mind, mind blown. blown. There you are. <laughs> or maybe it will be. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, back to you. I thank you. That's a very nice thing you've just told us. However, I don't think uh, <laughs> uh, even your cattle, aurochs included, aurochs included in that uh, study, aurochs included, aurochs included yeah. even they, I don't think, would have been able to drag this one, however. <laughs> we would have needed a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mind you, I bet there were a few blokes that would have, would have had a go anyway. But we're talking about rock art. Rock art, rock art is a wonderful thing. Um, it's also a heck of a right playground for the imagination, given that there are no real clues to the meaning and purpose it may have had for the people that created it. Uh, truth is, Rupert and I have dipped our toes in that water, and there's actually a really nice sequence in Standing the Stones, filmed at the Cairn Barn site in Argyle, where Rupert has a few, few words to say. Yeah, yes, we had your uh, theory to do with the sun and the... And who else, who else but Rupert Soskin would have had a sun compass in his pocket ready, ready and waiting? <laughs> it's rude not yeah, to. Yeah. 
I, dig I digress. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the thing is, I think the jury's going to be out for an awfully long time before we get a verdict on the meaning of rock art. But sometimes when researching for a few clues and getting a feel for how much there is and where examples are concentrated, I would come across reference to a site about 20 minutes drive from Glasgow city centre, where there is a huge gritstone outcrop covered in rock art. It's domed in the middle, it features dozens of carefully carved circular cup marks and cup and ring marks across the area of almost a hundred square metres. Dating from the third millennium BC, it is known as the Cochno Stone. Now what is weird though, if you look around and you Google Cochno Stone in the images, it, there, there aren't that many photos of it that date to any later than the 1930s. Well, that might have something to do with the fact that in 1965, the then Ministry of Works made the decision to bury it under a metre of soil from the surrounding fields. The overarching decision by bureaucrats to hide a pagan past, perhaps? No, actually, it was an act of conservation to protect our archaeological heritage from vandalism, unfortunately. But why would this bit of rock art in particular need the protection of the authorities for them to step in with such a drastic measure? There's a story here, and it's as much to do with personality as with archaeology. To tell that story, we're going to call upon the archaeologist who recently had the privilege of leading a project to uncover the Cochno Stone so it could be recorded digitally. And what follows is an excerpt from our interview with the urban prehistorian himself, none other than Dr Kenny Brophy of Glasgow University. Roll VT. But it's it's a yes yeah, it's, it's an it's an amazing story and it, it's one that it begged to be to have the involvement of the local community because it's a it's in an urban location which is what drew me to it in the first place and also I was invited to go and be involved by various different people. Um, I, I sort of knew about the story. It's a sort of mythical site in Scottish archaeology because mm. uh, it's an enormous rock art panel. Um, it's about hundred uh, square meters surface of this um, kind of. Uh, uh, whale back sort of shape um, sandstone block covered in hundreds of symbols cup and mark sim, cup and ring mark symbols and it was uh, and it was discovered in the 1980s 1890s and documented and then it sort of became a bit of a visitor attraction but then in 1937 uh, Ludovic Mann who you could probably do another whole program on yes. um, <laughs> We'd love to. <laughs> we <He's> could. A, <laughs> eccentric character, uh, and he and he decided to paint the entire surface of the Cochrane Stone using oil paints. Um, and I've been, I've, I've published a paper in January, actually, in, in, sorry, December, in the Scottish Archaeological Journal about what he was trying to do. It's very complicated, but it was ben basically a combination of trying to explain Neolithic cosmologies, prehistoric measurement schemes, and also something to do with eclipses as well. Mm. So there was five different things going on when he did this paint job, which must have taken him weeks because it's, mm. it's incredibly detailed and involves at least five different colours of oil paint. So you can imagine this is a, a scheduled, well, it, was, it, was a, it became scheduled quickly after that. So this is a, you know, imagine any prehistoric rock art panel in Britain. Imagine someone just painting the whole thing. It's just incredible. And that, and that seems to then have caused problems because people came to visit because this was, there was media attention. Clearly this was a, a quite a sight, you know, it was a very impressive thing. Um, people were moving into the area because of the Glasgow overspill in the fifties and sixties, housing estates were being built. And then more and more people were visiting the sites and they were annoying the landowners. People were carving their names into the stone. Um, so, you know, and kids were doing that in particular. And I think they were emboldened by the fact that Ludovic Mann had already painted it, you know, so it wasn't like it wasn't already in a bit of a state. So by the time it came to the mid 60s, the stone was covered in paint. It was covered in dozens of bits of graffiti and people were doing, you know, I think people were setting fires on it and stuff like that. And there's all sorts going yeah. on. And so it was decided by the Office of Works at the time to bury the stone to protect it from any more damage. So the order was given in 1965 and then it was it was just basically, there was a wall around the stone that was pushed in. The whole thing was covered in about half a metre to a metre's worth of claggy soil from nearby fields. And then that was sort of it. They, they didn't have any strategy as to what to do next. And mm -hmm. the local community who actually 
um, despite the fact that people had carved their names on it, that was actually because it was a local landmark. It was a local tradition. People felt very fondly about this site. They called it the Druid Stone. And it was one of several other rock art sites in the area. So people locally were disenfranchised from this incredible site almost overnight without any consultation. And so essentially it became this kind of, um, this lingering sore that, that kept on going for half a century. So when we uncovered it again in, um, in 2016 with the uh, Factum Foundation, a, a Spanish-based digital heritage organization who who did the, who did all the laser scanning work on Tutankhamun's tomb. So this was like a parallel project for them. And they did so, all of so the, that was the driver, was it? Was it the, getting yeah. the, the, yeah, mm-hmm. I see. Yeah, the drive, was, the drive was that they wanted to uncover it for the mm-hmm. 50th anniversary because they'd read media coverage and they wanted, um, and they wanted to do a digital uh, record, record of it, yeah. which they then could create into a 3D replica at some mm-hmm. point in the future, which is still... Yeah potentially on the cards. Um, so so they, they, they got asked me to be involved and and I was happy to come along. And so we uncovered it. And uncovering it, it kind of uncovered, it was like a, you know, a cork coming out of a bottle, you know, of, of local sentiment and nostalgia and excitement. Yeah. And lots of people just suddenly brought back memories of, oh yeah, that's right. I, I carved my name on the stone or I used to go and play on it when I was a child. So we, we we knew people were playing marble games on the stone because we found marbles during the un- uncovering of the stone. And, and why wouldn't you? Yeah, well, yeah, it's perfect for it with all the cup marks. And, and so yeah. and it was it was just wonderful. So And we actually spoke to people who carved, you know, carved their initials on the stone. You know, one guy, um, BS, um, he is known as, because that's his initials on the stone. He, he was a child. He broke his pen knife carving his initials onto the stone. And it's also, so, so there's this just, it was an incredible layering of, all these different things, you know, and it, it's a stone that, that people have been unable to resist making their mark on for 5,000 years, which is, is really a really compelling story. And, yeah. and it's now, and it's now there's a lot of enthusiasm across um, Faithfully, which is an area that has, is very deprived and, and needs a, needs a positive good news story. And so a lot of people who, who are based in local housing associations and locally see the rock art as being a, a better future for Faithfully where it can become a tourist destination or pe- or pl- a place that's known for its rock art and not known for drugs or unemployment or crime or any of the other things that people associate with um, areas of social deprivation. So it's gone from being like a, a, a technical recording process of a site with an interesting story to actually being something which is, it's like, it's really exciting to see. Yeah. It's emotional to see um, local people, you know, be inspired by their heritage and their prehistory and really mm-hmm. to get it and understand the value of it you know we did a we had a just before the lockdown started last year we had a, a um, reception in the Scottish Parliament that was hosted by the cult, the culture secretary in Scotland Fiona Hislop and as part of that the local MSP was talking and other people talk and the MSP was crying you know he was emotional because he he thought you know if only when I was a kid living growing up in um, in Western Scotland I had I'd had a chance to engage with our heritage in this way and and he was really emotional about the potential for changing a part of his constituency so it really affects people in a way that yeah. as archaeologists it's often e- easy to become blasé and think well okay it's five thousand years old okay i see that every other week but you know actually for other people it blows their minds and it's and mm-hmm. it's and it's really powerful yeah. so prehistory is something which of course is interesting for its own right and we should continue to understand the value of prehistory but i think also prehistory has a has a resonance for people today that is not really properly tapped into and that's one of the key things that sort of drives my my research just now number nine well this one blew our minds for a number of reasons and not least of all because it was yet another bronze age culture that's been known about for years but not by us. We'd never heard of them. <laughs> um, we are going to the Bronze Age ruins of La Almoloya in southeastern Spain, in what is now modern day Murcia. Now, La Almoloya is an important hilltop complex, one of many sites built by the El Agar culture, and occupied between approximately 2200 and 1500 years BC. Uh, The site was discovered back in the 1880s and excavations have been going on for many years but the particular discovery we're talking about here dates to around 1700 BC. 
It was actually unearthed in 2014, but the excavation reports have only just been published. Uh, a number of burials have been found beneath the floor of a large hall, which appears to be the most important structure in the whole complex. Now, within the context of, El of other El Argar sites, this building has been interpreted as being a seat of political decision making. There are reasons for that rationale, but we won't go into those now. It's certainly the largest hall in this palatial fortress. Now, the walls are lined with benches, and at one end there is a hearth and a podium, so there's no question that it was an important place within the society. But it's the most recently discovered grave, burial number 38, which has caused such excitement, and which initially was what uh, blew our minds at the time. Mm. Archaeologists from the Autonomous University of Barcelona have discovered the high-status grave of a man and a woman buried together in a large ceramic jar. Analysis has revealed that the man died some years before the woman, and the tomb was reopened for her to be placed alongside him. And what makes this discovery so important is that the vast majority of all the lavish grave goods were buried with the woman, not the man, with the clear implication that it was the woman who was the more important individual in this society. Now, the man whose bones showed the sort of wear associated with long-term horse riding died at around 35 years of age and was buried with his own fineries, including bead jewellery, flared golden plug-type ear adornments, a silver ring and a copper dagger decorated with silver rivets. By contrast, the woman, who was in her 20s when she died, had a variety of health and congenital problems, including missing neck vertebra and rib. She had a shortened left thumb, and scarring on her rib cage suggests that she may have had a heart infection. But here's the thing. She was laid to rest with a wealth of silver grave goods. She wore earplugs with silver spirals looped through them. More silver spirals had fastened her hair, she wore a silver bracelet and silver ring. Amongst other items placed alongside her were silver plates and a wooden awl, also decorated with silver. However, the most impressive item was a silver diadem, still in place around her head. It is one of only six ever found in Argaric graves. Another intriguing aspect of these diadems is they have been found with the disc pointing upwards and downwards. In this burial, it was downwards to lie over or beyond the bridge of her nose. Now, obviously, it is impossible to say with absolute certainty, but it does seem clear from the burial that the young woman was superior in status to the man, possibly even a queen. And this has raised many questions around the standard view of patriarchal societies in prehistory. Hundreds of El Agar sites and burials have been excavated, and in high-status burials they are known to have included important grave goods with girls from as young as six years old. This is something never granted to boys under the age of around 12. And it doesn't end there. Found beneath the floor of another room nearby, was the grave of a baby girl who was between 12 and 18 months old when she died. DNA analysis revealed that she was the daughter of this couple, and further investigation is going to be carried out to see if anything can be learned about why she wasn't buried with her parents. And then there's the even more mind-blowing aspects of the entire El Agar culture and their very abrupt end. Uh, if we did a deep dive onto that, we'd be here all day, but we really what would, can we wouldn't. say just to pique people's interest here? Well, I, I think possibly the most fascinating thing, the, the thing that significantly blew our minds, is that what brought about the end of the El Agar culture completely, in everywhere that it was found throughout uh, Spain, was uh, a, what appears to be a revolution from the inside. Yes, uh, yeah. it, 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 was, it was not people coming, you know, warring from outside. This was, it was as if they, the, the population were held as slaves and finally they'd had enough because the entire culture just disappeared 
overnight. And that's literally, mm. uh, okay, might, might not be literally overnight, but it's overnight in terms of, you know, day-to-day -day life, uh, you know, not geologically overnight or archaeologically overnight. It just went. Uh, yeah, yeah, extraordinary, extraordinary. But, uh, it must uh, be noted, you know, that the uh, th these, it seems that these settlements were all burnt, you know, 85% of them were burnt at the same time, got the same yeah. date on, on that uh, burning. Uh, and also it must be marked that many of these settlements were high on hilltops in what is a very rugged um, landscape. And mm. if people were wondering, well, what has this got to do with megaliths, megalithomania, and so on and so forth? Well, it seems, well, that these people were hauling very large stones all over the place for mm. battlements. Some of the, the high walls and, uh, 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 in one instance, um, you know, and this speaks to their control of the silver production line, as it were, that a settlement devoted to workshops in you know, making silver, you know, processing silver looks like a James Bond evil villain's lair on top it, of it. It does, doesn't it? It really it, does. Yeah. Yeah. They transported, so they mined tin, a tin, a bigger pardon, they mined silver. Um, and they brought it from huge distances. I mean, there, there was, yeah. uh, you know, some that was found, it was 150 miles away from where it was mined, mm. something like that. Mm. Mm. Um, and it's known that they traded throughout the Mediterranean. And and the thing is that we know that Britain was trading. You oh. know, there's tin <laughs> from Britain, uh, for example, has been found all over the place. So there were very probably some very strong connections there that we just don't know about. You know, maybe mm. with El mm. Argar, this is another aspect of can we join any of these dots together? Yeah, yeah. You know, using other cultures as anchor points maybe we'll see but uh, there are so many more clues in the qualities of agaric culture that uh, we could go into but taken all together it seems that archaeologists are coming to the conclusion that el agar culture was the first state in yeah. western europe you know, Good there point. have already Good point, been Mr. states in uh, you know talk of egypt and mesopotamia but this is the first mm. state, which is extraordinary because, you know, our sort of knowledge usually starts with Mycenae and, and, and Greece and, you know, mm. much uh, uh, more recent. But to imagine that there was a, an established state with control over territory uh, yeah. the size of Belgium, we're told, back then is uh, astonishing. And that is majorly, I suppose, what blew our minds, that it had to have been so under the radar. Mm. There you go. Well, here we are. So quickly at number 10. So th this is the last one. And this is salutary lesson to all of us. We've got uh, something to cheer us up here. Something to cheer us up. Well, it cheered me up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was an exhibition at the Roma and... Uh, let me say that again. Roma in uh, Roma und <laughs> Palizeus Museum. You sure you in, don't want to do that again? No, Roma <laughs> und Palizeus Museum in Hildesheim in Germany. Um, <laughs> the, the exhibition was entitled, uh, forgive the translation, Mistakes and Fakes in Archaeology. And uh, it included all sorts of ridiculous fakes. I, I mean, the most ridiculous was a, the, a narwhal's tusk that had been stuck on various other bones, which the faker claimed was a unicorn. <laughs> Um, but the item that really stands out for us is the sort of error that illustrates just how important it is for us to stick with facts and not keep grasping for the lavish and ritual side of things. The item in question is actually an Iron Age artefact, but the point it makes is completely timeless. Back in 1838, a German collector dug up what appeared to be a crown. It was a ring of engraved triangles pointing upwards, as you would imagine any crown would do, with a riveted metal band curving over the top. So, you know, rather like the elastic does on a modern head torch. And that crown was proudly displayed for 150 years in the museum. Until recently, somebody found another one. Absolutely identical, except that this one was complete. And the triangles didn't point upwards, they pointed downwards. And it was still attached to the rest of the artefact, 
which was made of wood. The impressive royal crown was actually the top ring of a wooden bucket, and the riveted crest was simply the handle. A fancy bucket, a fancy bucket it has to be said, but a bucket nonetheless. Bucket. <laughs> and let that be a lesson to us all. Now, on that note, the way we interpret things, you know, a, a couple of months back we interviewed Dr. Lee Bray. He's the head archaeologist for Dartmoor National Park, lovely bloke. And he said something that so perfectly sums up the inherent problem within archaeology and emphasises why we do need to be so careful in our interpretations. He said, Archaeology is like looking into a well. It's very dark, and often all you see is your self-reflected back. Isn't that so very true? And on that profound note from Dr Bray, thank you very much for listening to us, folks. We'll have a quick shuffle and join you back in the room in a moment. Fantastic. Thank you very much, guys. We uh, really appreciate that. And if uh, you'd like to join us on the screen, Rupert and Michael, and we've got a couple of questions have come in um, and uh, we'll give you those. We'll jump right in. So make sure you are muted. So the first one here is from Nicholas Ray, and this is for Rupert regarding the Polish grave. Uh, number one, do we know how old it might be? And number two, I'll, I'll give you it all here. Does the content of the grave perhaps suggest that this was a matriarchal society? The general definition of such is deemed to be that inheritance will be through the mother, mother line, as this is the only parental link which can be proven. So what do you make of that? I think that was directed to Rupert, but obviously Michael can jump in on that as well. Uh, yeah, so the, the, uh, 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 good morning, apart from anything else. Um, uh, uh, can you uh, uh, just go over that question again? Because uh, we're talking about the Polish grave, and then and then you mention matriarchal uh, society. So are, are yeah. we talking about matriarchal in relation to the Polish grave or in relation to the El Argar culture? I think it's about the Polish grave. The first one was how old it was. Uh, okay, it's it was. Uh, it's five thousand years old. Three thousand. I think it's three. The, the figures have come out at three thousand and twenty BC. Okay. And she ba basically she was asking, um, you know, do you think it's a matriarchal grave? That one, the Polish one, uh, because of what was found inside it. I mean, I'm intrigued by that um, because the, I mean, there was entire families in there, except uh, for the fathers of the deceased weren't uh, weren't in the grave. So uh, I I don't see that necessarily as a as a as a matriarchal thing. I mean, it was it, it was a, a jumble of bodies. Um, although the bodies were placed in familial groups, yeah. but it was nevertheless 15 men, women and children all buried in the same grave. So I, I'm not sure okay. uh, what you mean about the matriarchal aspect there. So I think it was just uh, you know, a comment on uh, the possibility of that. I mean, we've got a few, couple more questions coming in. By the way, uh, we've just got a few minutes for this. Uh, this is a message to the attendees. Um, and if you're going to ask questions, make sure it's in the Q&A box, not the chat box. So the second question was from Simon Banton. He's a good friend of the conference, a former speaker. And he's asking about uh, GOSEC. And he was intrigued by the latitude of that because it's within one kilometer, I think, of um, the latitude of Stonehenge. Um, and if you transplanted it westwards to the Stonehenge landscape, it would be easily visible to the north of Stonehenge. Um, have you looked into the, anything to do with the latitude and the placement of these sites? Hi there, folks. Uh, good morning. Uh, Michael here. Hope you enjoyed the, the presentation there. Um, no, we haven't, because I, I think, as I noted in the, um, in, in the piece, that uh, uh, Gothic is way, way older. Um, I would hesitate to try, kind of draw any correlations between something that's... Um, uh, what, 4,500 uh, BC to something that's 2,000, 2,500 uh, BC. You know, and that was really rather the point of the, the presentation that, you know, of that uh, bit um, um, of uh, pointing out the existence of Christ Grabenenagen, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> this, this enormous stretch in time 
which to my mind at least would rather exclude any kind of correlation from a, a, a geographic perspective okay. ge geometric perspective shall I say. it's also worth pointing out that you know we're seeing sites that have been found because of crop marks that have then been excavated and uh, uh, and restored but these sites were all over the place so yeah. the fact that there's a kilometer discrepancy well you know there were probably another 10 that were yeah. less than a kilometer discrepancy you know we're, we're very good at oh. seeing patterns where they might not necessarily belong yeah. Okay, and he also adds it's partly to do with um, it has implications for the astronomy because it's known and this is something Robin Heath's uh, done a lot of research on is that um, that latitude specific astronomical kind of configurations can be recorded um, and this is what has been found at Stonehenge so I think that was uh, Simon's made a second point about that so that could I mean it, maybe it needs more research and maybe Simon mm. oh sure I, I think those people have done a lot of research on the individual uh, alignment of uh, uh, each, uh, I'll, I'll hesitate to call them monument, um, but uh, the entrances and uh, openings do seem to, um, you know, uh, line up with uh, sun risings and settings and that that kind of thing. But uh, as far as a relationship to uh, uh, between sites, that's another matter. Okay, okay. And uh, we've got another question from uh, Ali Cooper. And he asked, cup and ring marks are suspiciously similar visually in causewayed enclosures and henges. What do you make of that? Cup and ring marks Tumbleweed. in terms of... Um, um, they're, they're visually similar. Well, they're kind of ubiquitously similar, aren't they? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it, it's... Uh, I, I, I personally... I don't really make anything of it because so much is unknowable. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's often discussion about, you know, you, you find a stone like the Cochno stone, uh, you know, okay, which is ridiculous, uh, you know, it's bigger than anything else. But, but think of any cup and ring marked stone that you can. We have no idea over what period of time those markings might have been made. You know, they might all have been made in one single project, but they could have just been built up on over generations and generations. You, know, you could have a thousand years between the first circle being cut and, and the last. We just don't know. Okay. Okay. Good, good. Uh, there's, uh, I would run through these questions. We've just got a couple more, a few more minutes. Um, uh, Matthew Smith, um, he asked your comment on the European henges, any thought to potential migrations from East to West, starting from perhaps Eastern Turkey, um, and do the dates make sense? <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> uh, yes, it's actually something that we're doing a lot of work on in the background. Um, uh, we, we know, I mean, over, over vast periods of time, you know, we know that there were migrations of people from east to west. You know, we know that the Beaker people came into uh, to Britain, for example. Um, and uh, and when you look at cultural similarities, particularly when you look at some of the aspects of farming in Anatolia, that you know you can imagine these uh, these things gradually moving their way westwards. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I mean it's a very um, sort of abrupt answer, but yes, I, I, we do think that yeah. that culturally, you know, movements of ideas, not least of all going from uh, yeah. uh, from east to west is is almost a given it, it's very very tempting to make the correlations and to uh, you know i think that was what i was trying to invite you know myself with that bit is we need to look further into this to make any connections and so you know we'll be doing that and hope other people um, come up with uh, stuff that supports it you know triangulates the um, uh, the, mm. the, the connection yeah brilliant thank you okay we've got a couple more uh we've got michelle she says excellent presentation as always uh question thank on you. rock art in scotland has anyone deciphered the markings or of any theories of it being a star map has that been looked at uh, well, well that's what i think uh, ludovic mann was looking at right. when mm. he painted the cockle <laughs> stone um it, yes uh, so the yes there are people all the while looking at that kind of stuff and the other um it may be worthwhile you know chasing down um 
uh, uh, Tim Darville and his uh, thoughts about uh, cup and ring markings and their possible connections with healing um, mm. and, and water uh, as well. So that's another uh, direction to look at. I have to say, uh, personally, I, I, I favour favor that one. I think that's got distinct possibilities. We've got another um, kind of long question from Katie Ball here about the Concho Stone. Um, and there's what is it? Cockno, Cockno, Hugh, Cockno. Oh, oh Cockno Stone. Yes. No, Cockno. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's uh, the di- some person, she said there's some research being done on the, on the markings, diagrams, of the heavens. Were they marking a disaster cycle? And Rem- uh, so I can't really read this and talking about co- comets, you know, they're recording yeah. comets coming in and things like this and like a dragon's tail can represent, you know, the, the coming off the comet and so forth. That's right. Um, well, you can either interpret, there's a couple of carving on, is it two, two or three down in, in the corner? They look like comets. They also look like feet, albeit four toed feet, but the, <laughs> and uh, you pay your money and it takes your choice. I think um, the, but yeah, I, I I hear it. But I'd like to know. But how can you, you know, arrive at a, at a conclusion about it? That's the thing. What what uh, what piece of evidence will bring it all together and uh, and and make any make study conclusive mm. about rock art? That's and, what we, and we've got uh, one more question. This is uh, this is brilliant from Hugh Evans. Hi Hugh. Um, what was number eleven? And was that the biggest? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what uh, what dropped off the radar? Yeah. I've forgotten. So many. Yeah, there were yeah. so many. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I'll just toss one in. They found a bronze hand, um, a very Game of Thrones. It's a bronze hand, and they reckon that it could have been a prosthetic hand, although it's quite small. Um, uh, but just because it's small, you know, that just means, well, maybe it was for a young adolescent or something like that don't know but uh, yeah they found the bronze hand do you remember where they found that mike was that another siberian one uh um, no I, I can't remember i don't remember off the top of my head yeah i'll tell you what we you, one of the things that that we do all the time is we, you know we're gathering this archaeological news from all over the world and we subscribe to all sorts of news feeds and I have to say that my personal favourite from anywhere is the Siberian Times. You know, it's just a newspaper, but oh, uh, yeah, but they yeah. just report so much archaeological stuff. You know, so if you go to the Siberian Times website and just go through their archaeology, they you know they do stunning work. And that obviously from there you can go to source papers and get to the uh, the core research. But yeah, uh, wonderful resource, the Siberian Times. <laughs> uh, one other thing I think that I'd like to point people to is that um, uh, uh, it, it kind of dropped off the radar because it was about a, a person uh, rather than a, a monument or, or a, a ma- and that is we were gonna, we were we we're going to talk about Professor Vince Gaffney. Now I don't know if you know that name or not, but Vince has been the driver behind remote sensing and he's the guy associated with the discovery of the pits around Durrington walls but also uh he's the major major um driver also behind research on doggerland uh uh he dis- he, he was part of the discovery team that, that um, investigated warren fields which is a, a mesolithic site with astronomical alignments would you believe i mean we could have done warren fields couldn't we rupert we could have done warren fields that yeah. yeah that would have been uh, an interesting one but it would have been here till uh, this afternoon though so. yeah, yeah 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 but uh, <laughs> no vince gaffney is one of those extraordinary heroes of archaeology that you probably don't uh, get to hear about that often um I think well, he's got an MBE for his uh, oh, for okay. his honors, for his efforts, but uh, yeah. Well, put, put in a good word and let's uh, get him uh, megalithomania next year because I think yeah, 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 fantastic yeah, addition. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, talking about people who I don't think would say no to talking at megalithomania, uh, uh, Kenny Brophy. Okay. Kenny Brophy, he's good. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. I've got one more question. Um, <laughs> This is from, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce your name correctly here, Seal or Keel. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Could Thank it have been so. children who drew on the rocks, on the, 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 the stone in Scotland, perhaps? It, well, it obviously could be, but, you know, that's, yeah. it's, it's not a five-minute job to, no, um, to, uh, <laughs> to peck rings in a 
great big lump of sandstone. It's very telling that uh, BS broke his penknife. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. yeah. And we're talking about yeah. Neolithic, you know, so they're, they're doing this with, uh, you know, they're chipping it away with stones or maybe ant the picks or, yeah. or, you know, whatever tools they might have had at yeah. their yeah. disposal. So, yeah, it could have been children, but that's <laughs> children with a lot of time on their hands. And a, and a purpose, too. <laughs> right. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions. Um, I thank you again, Michael and Rupert. It's a brilliant presentation. Thanks for thank your pleasure. pleasure. Joining us for the Q&A. And... Uh, we uh, I do recommend people uh, subscribe to their podcast, the Prehistory Guys, and also check out their YouTube channel. They've got a lot of great content on there. And Not to they, mention, uh, sorry, go on, Hugh. No, no, and they've got a, a fantastic pay, patron page where they give uh, content just to patrons, and you can support them on that. And um, and uh, they've got a lot more coming. So, and I'm looking forward to the follow up to Standing with Stones. That sounds like it's going to be a great film. Yay! <laughs> it's coming. Watch this space. (laughs) 